In today's video, Noah and I set our sights on some cosmic aspirations. Microchips, calculators, cake? All of these things were gonna be used to make our rocket ship that would take us to the moon. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. In today's 400 days, we are going to space. We read your comments, so here it is. Get yourselves comfortable, because Noah and I are conquering the moon in the mod pack, Create Above and Beyond. You wanna play mod packs with friends, but you can't seem to find a good server. And the free ones? With the big mod packs these days, free servers are just too laggy. Luckily for you, there's Bisect Hosting. They host my server, and with plenty of affordable options, they can host your server too. And the best part is, they support almost every mod pack. Use code DOUBLESAL at checkout for 25% off your first order. Bisect Hosting, a great site for great servers. The first day of our next 100 days started off relatively simple. There were a number of things that we had to accomplish on this journey, and the first thing that we were going to tackle was making plastic. Now to make this plastic ingot, you needed nine of these little microplastics. To combine them, you needed to place them inside of a basin over a superheated blaze burner. And to get this blaze burner superheated, you had to feed it blaze cakes. If we were going to build a rocket ship and go to the moon, we first had to bake a cake. You needed four simple ingredients. Sugar, eggs, and cinder flour. You combine them all together to make a blaze cake base, but to complete the recipe, you have to fill the base with lava. So, our first step was to go get some eggs. We didn't have any chicken farms, but there were plenty of birds on the island. So, we went out into the wild to see what we could gather. Now, we were only able to find one chicken, but we did find a couple of seagulls and a few kiwi birds. Now that we had the eggs, the next step was to grind netherrack into cinder flour. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that cinder flour was made out of netherrack. But it is a blaze cake, so that seems to make some sense. Once we had cinder flour, the only thing left was to get the sugar. Thankfully, we had a sugarcane farm, and once we had that, it was time to combine them all and make the blaze cake base. With the base prepped and ready to go, there was only one thing left to do. I made my way to the nether and placed the bases on the conveyor belt. One by one, each cake would get its lava filling before heading back into the overworld. On the other side of the portal was a beautiful line of blaze cakes ready for the taking. Now that we could heat the blaze burner, it was time to make some plastic. And to do this, we were gonna need something called a matter condenser. This purple block was essential to make plastic. There was no other way, so we had to craft it. The main two ingredients were gonna be the ME controller, a block we made in the last video, and a fluix pearl. We took the fluix crystal, grounded it up, and made some powder, and after that, we surrounded the ender pearl with all the crafting materials. I crafted the matter condenser, and then after that I had to buy some certus quartz for our next crafting recipe. We needed to craft a storage component. It's basically a type of chip that would go inside the matter condenser. Basically, the chip stores energy and converts it into plastic. Unfortunately, we had a little workplace accident in the process. Zero days without a workplace accident, that just happened. <laughs> Let's move on. No! <laughs> why do you, I just wanna... why are you dying that my... way? It was time to power the matter condenser. The machine feeds on blocks. One block equals one energy. So we placed down an igneous extruder, basically a fancy cobblestone generator. For every second that went by, one cobblestone was generated from the extruder and transferred via item pipe into the matter condenser where the block was converted into one energy. It took a whole lot of energy to make one matter plastic, so we needed to find a way to feed tons of items into the matter condenser. Not only did it accept blocks to convert into energy, but it accepted any item. Even saplings, which we had a ton of thanks to our wood farm. With a massive influx of saplings going into the matter condenser, we were generating enough energy to produce matter balls at a faster rate. I set a second matter condenser down so that we could produce twice the amount of matter balls. I would just leave them there and come back to them later when we had more plastic to harvest. At this point, we did have some plastic to work with, so we could get some of the smaller crafting recipes out of the way, like a spacesuit. I took whatever matter balls we had collected and put them into the basin so that we could heat up the blaze burner and smash it all into plastic ingots. To make the spacesuit, you had to actually use a mechanical crafter. Regular crafting table wasn't gonna work, so I put the pieces in, flattened gold, a couple of plastic ingots, and to be honest, I'm surprised this wasn't that expensive to make. With the helmet complete, we moved on to the other parts of the spacesuit, including the boots, the pants, and the chest piece, which was surprisingly different from the other pieces because this one required an oxygen tank, something we had to fill later. We were early into our 100 days and we finally had a full-fledged spacesuit. Shortly after, Noah and I began to clear the trees for our next big project. With a little fire, anything's possible. Throughout the night, the forest burned in the flames of progress. It was a true sight to behold. 
With the forest cleared, it was time to start terraforming. We needed a good foundation for our next big structure. Noah and I spent the rest of the night breaking up the land. We worked to the morning, and as the sun rose, its warm rays shined on our job well done. With the foundation complete, we can now start working on the outline for the next building, a new money machine. This new building would be larger, grander, and far more profitable than our iron golem farm. But before we could progress any further, we had to stop and preserve our history. Some things are best left unchanged. As for the money machine, well, it was going to be one big berry farm. Did I forget to mention that we were going to build two of them? My only problem was that the berry farms were going to be far away from our original factory, but I'm sure that's something we could remedy later. We began to fill up the first layer, and this is how we were going to divide the labor. I was going to work on the aesthetic tasks, making sure that this berry farm had a beautiful facade, while Noah was going to do the more technical side of things, making sure that the farm actually functioned. Through the power of teamwork, Noah and I worked simultaneously. Through the course of multiple days, we worked to ensure that this berry farm would be forged into reality as a tool that would help us on our financial endeavors. Our money machine berry farm was finally taking shape. I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. Life is plastic. It's fantastic. Sorry you had to see that. At the end of our project, we had a beautiful multi-leveled berry farm. On each floor were dozens of berry bushes. Each plant was being consistently harvested by the rotational harvester. All it took was one spin around for a few stacks of berries. The berries would be dropped down the funnel into the trade station where they would be then exchanged for beautiful precious silver. From this point onward, we were making way more money than ever. With the new money factory finally complete, it was time to build a pipeline. We were going to be pumping destabilized redstone from one side of the island to the other. This liquid was going to be used to make processors, little microchips that would be helpful for making our infinite storage, and they would also be used as necessary crafting items for some of our rocket components. The design would be simple. All I had to do was dig a tunnel from one factory to another. After burrowing through the ground and collecting hundreds of blocks later, I finally reached the other factory, or specifically, the underside of the factory. I made a little staircase and went to the surface. I looked around and tried to figure out what was going to go where. After that, it was time to craft some pipes. All we had to do now was connect one tank to another. Compared to what we usually do, this task was probably the easiest thing I've done in a long time. The pipes were then installed along the tunnel wall. And if you're wondering why I decided to put the pipes underground instead of up on the surface, well, it was just an aesthetic choice. I mean, have you seen what the inside of our factory looks like? After that, it was time to recycle some old parts. In the metals building, we had some old fluid tanks that we just weren't using. So, I had to demolish them and take them to the other factory so that we could repurpose them. The last item on our to-do list was to install fluid pumps. Now, as you know, this is a very long pipeline, and such pipelines require multiple pumps, because if we only had one, that single pump wouldn't have enough power to take the liquid from one end of the pipeline to the other. I wanted to make sure that this thing was going to work, so I converted the fluid pipes into glass fluid pipes. That way I could actually see if the fluid was flowing through. With the pipeline now complete, it was time to assemble the fluid tank. Now this was a fairly large tank, and I'm pretty sure we weren't going to use all the storage inside, but it looked cool, so I kept it. I switched the pipeline on, and all of the cogs were rotating, the pumps were pumping. Now it was just a matter of whether or not the liquid was flowing. And thankfully it was! Usually when we switch these things on, we don't always get them working on our first try. But it was a pipeline. I mean, how could you actually mess up a pipeline? Back at the other factory, the fluid tank was getting filled with the stabilized redstone. Everything was going according to plan, but there was one thing that we didn't take into account. We weren't producing enough to stabilize redstone at a fast rate. So in order to resolve this problem and speed production up, we had to add a rotational speed controller to the destabilized redstone manufacturing process. Now if you don't know, a rotational speed controller does exactly what it's named. It controls how fast the cogs spin. So, all we had to do was raise the number, and the cogs would spin faster. Quicker machines equals quicker production. While I was wrapping things up with the pipeline, Noah had started construction on a second berry tower. With two money machines at our disposal, nothing was going to be out of our reach. It was time to begin the next assembly line. Each processor would have its own dedicated conveyor belt, and above the conveyor belt would be the pipeline for the destabilized redstone. Next, I added a trio of deployers. They would install the circuits onto the printed silicon, the first step in making the processor. 
Next we added some spouts to make sure that these circuits would get squirted with the stabilized redstone, and after that, all we had to do was switch it on to make sure that everything was running properly. Once we got the mechanical belts running in sync, it was time to do a trial run, so I put in some circuits and some printed silicon, and thankfully, everything was running smoothly. With the working assembly line now complete, it was time to figure out how to automate the whole process. Now before you make a processor, you have to make a circuit. And to make circuits, you usually have to pour molten metal over presses. Basically, they act as casts. Now don't ask me why we chose to make the processor assembly line before the circuit assembly line, as obviously you need circuits to make processors. Though we did do a little demo during one of the first livestream sessions. In order to make this work, we needed a way to melt metals quickly. So, we decided to turn our attention to the Magma Crucible. This block allows you to melt down all metals, including diamonds. Once everything was melted down, the metals would be pumped into these large fluid tanks. I also wanted to incorporate a fluid valve. This would give us greater control over the flow of metals. Each tank would have its own valve, and they would all be connected to a single wheel that I would turn left to open and right to close. The next step was to connect the fluid tanks to the blast chillers. Now usually you can make circuits one of two ways. You can either pour the metals with a smeltree, or you can use a blast chiller. And since the smeltree setup was way too big to build, I decided to just take the easy route and use the blast chiller since they only took up one block of space. The setup was finally complete. The magma crucibles would melt the metals down and store them into the fluid tanks, and then from the fluid tanks they would be pumped to the blast chillers, and from the blast chillers circuits would be produced, and they would drop down into the assembly line where the circuits would then be converted into processors. All we had to do now was to buy the materials themselves. When we finally ran it for the first time, everything was running as it should have. But there was one problem, and it was a big problem. Usually it takes only one ingot to make one circuit. But for some reason, the blast chiller was using four ingots. Four ingots to make one circuit! Thankfully, we figured out that you could actually attach pipes to casting tables and pump it in there directly. So, we were back to using one ingot per circuit. After taking on that big task, I decided to work on a little side project. Now, I know we had already built a train, and it was a nice train, at least I thought it was, but that took way too long. So in this case, we were just gonna use a minecart because we were building a little rail system. I just needed something simple that would get me from point A to point B, straight from the factory to the money farm, and then back to the factory again. If you like to watch the live streams, then you will know that running between the money farm and the factory takes way too long. So this was gonna be a nice little way to cut the travel time in half. For the time being, I'm sure we would make some good use of this little rail system, but it was time to move on. Now I hope you brought your thinking caps, because today, we're gonna do a little math. That's right, we were gonna be making numbers. One through nine, including zero, we were gonna be doing addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, whatever it was that would get us these numbers, we had to do it. So, it was time to do the one subject I dreaded the most. But before I could start reliving the nightmare that was grade school, I had to build a few smelteries. Now, what could a smeltery possibly have to do with math? Well, you have to stop and ask yourselves, what are these numbers going to be made out of? Well, the reason we were going to make smelteries was because these numbers were going to be made out of melted calculation mechanisms. Believe it or not, once the calculation mechanisms are melted down, they become liquid logic. With the smeltery setup, we were going to be pouring this liquid logic into number casts. The big problem was that we could only make casts for the numbers 8 and 3. We also had casts for the operations. You know, plus, minus, multiply, divide. So with those four operations and the numbers 8 and 3, we needed to find a way to produce all of the other numbers. And how do you make the other numbers? You have to do math problems. That's not a joke! If you want to get the number 5, then you literally have to put 8 minus 3 into the mechanical crafter, and then you get the number 5. We were gonna have to make a lot of numbers, and the current setup that we had, though it was nice, it just wasn't gonna be sufficient. So, the next course of action was to build a big smeltery. On top of that, we were gonna have to make what I'm just gonna call a giant calculator. Something that automatically did the math problems for us. Not only that, but to actually produce the numbers, we would have the liquid logic pumped into these casting tables. And in the casting tables, we would have the numbers 8, 3, and any other operation we needed to get the numbers 0 through 9. I know I've said this before, and I will say it again, because every time I do stuff like this, it always gets more difficult, but this was probably the most challenging thing I've ever had to design. Thank goodness I had some reference videos. Thank you, Chosen Architect. After that, it was just a matter of connecting the actual machine to the smeltery. 
I had to work through a maze of pipes just to make sure that they wouldn't interfere with one another. I collected a few stacks of calculation mechanisms so that we could get them melted down. This smeltery had a massive capacity. It didn't take long before my multiple stacks of calculation mechanisms were all liquid logic. Once everything was set up, I dismantled the platform that I was using to build, and after that, I turned the machine on and everything ran beautifully. With the help of our pipe system, the liquid logic was flowing from our smeltery setup all the way over to our calculator. There, the casts were being filled with liquid logic. The numbers would then cool and solidify before going down the chute into the next mechanical crafter. There, they would be participating in the next equation to produce the next set of numbers. This was by far my favorite machine. I decided to give it the respect it deserved by building it its own wing of the factory. I decided to go for a basic design, one that was consistent with the already existing structure. Granite walls, wood fence windows. I even decided to add its own new, unique feature, a glass ceiling. The new calculator wing was finally complete. I thought it was so nice that I created the exact same design on the other side of the factory. Now the big question, why did we need all of these numbers? That glowing cube? It's called a computation matrix. The only way to make that is if we melt down all the numbers and combine them together. I gathered one stack of each number, then I put together a new smeltery setup. It's here where we would take the numbers, melt them down, and mix them all together. And there were a lot of numbers to melt down. Once we had melted enough down, they mixed automatically and produced this sparkling rainbow liquid. That was exactly what we wanted. Now up until now, I was dumping stacks of numbers into the smeltery by hand. I wanted the numbers to travel on their own, so I decided to make a transportation system made of item pipes. The numbers would flow from their storage drawers through the item pipes and into the smeltery. This was a pretty solid system. And now that we were processing numbers automatically, we could finally make our very first computation matrix. And all we had to do was pour it from the faucet into the basin. Simple as that. The result was this strange Rubik's Cube looking block. After all that hard work, it was so nice to finally have one. <laughs> Only eight more to go. Before we began our next task, I decided to pay the Money Machine Factory a little visit, only to discover that Noah had finally finished building the second berry farm tower. I needed to make a withdraw, because I was about to craft myself a very useful, yet very expensive item. I ended up buying a number of weird crafting ingredients, but trust me when I say that the payoff is worth it. Now yes, we were veering away a little from the science machine stuff that we've always worked on, but a little bit of magic never hurt anybody. I was crafting a staff called a Rending Gale. With the Rending Gale, you could do a number of things, such as pushing mobs away, you could even use it for flying. Of course, there was the matter of actually charging the staff. I tried to use the Energetic Infuser, but in this case, science wasn't gonna work. We had to use magic for a magic staff. It turns out that the staff actually ran on feathers. So, I bought myself some feathers, and shortly after, I was soaring through the sky. Now this was the way to travel. Now one thing I completely forgot about was the matter condenser. This whole time it was producing plastic. I decided to take whatever plastic had accumulated and smash them down into plastic ingots, because it was time to move on to the next project. With all the plastic in hand, we could finally assemble some of the first few pieces for our rocket. With the first component being the actual launch pad. These crafting recipes were very simple. All we had to do was take some stone, mix it with a plastic ingot, and we got five launch pad blocks. The only catch was that this wasn't regular stone. This was a more denser version of stone that we had to compact together. So I went back to the berry factory, took some of the spare cobblestone, and got started on that. I wanted to see what the landing pad blocks were gonna look like, and I gotta say, I love connected textures. The next step was to build the launch tower, and like the landing pad, this block was pretty cheap to make. Although to be honest, this did just look like retextured scaffolding. The next block to check off our list was the rocket assembly machine. Some of the crafting items were a pair of diamond gears. This was a pretty expensive thing to make, so it was time to make a withdrawal from the National Bank of Double Cell. Once we had the diamond gears, we took all the parts to the mechanical crafter and watched all the pieces come together to make our rocket assembly machine. With this machine, we could look at all of our rocket specs, including its thrust, its weight, how much fuel we had, and how fast it was going to be. Now that we had all the pieces for our launch pad structure, we could finally see the rocket schematic itself. When it came to the rocket's design, there were a few items to tackle, but at this point, nothing was out of our reach. Now obviously, if we're gonna go to space, then we need oxygen, we need air. Thankfully, there was a way of making that. That's right folks, we're making air. And believe it or not, the process was actually pretty simple. 
I wanted an area dedicated specifically for rocket stuff. I wanted a place where we could make the fuel, where we could make the air, where we could build the launch pad and the rocket itself. I began construction on a bridge. This bridge would lead to a special area where we could complete all of our rocket tasks. Once I completed the outline of the bridge, it was just a matter of filling out the floor and coming up with the design for the area where we would launch our rocket. Now, based on our current architectural surroundings, it seemed like we had a pretty common theme going on here. Granted in sandstone, you can never go wrong with those items. I began to fill out the floor of our bridge, opting for a checkered pattern. Once the floor was filled out, it was time to make the outline for the actual launch pad area itself. Now Noah had a couple of ideas of how the floor should look for this area, so I left it to him. And over the course of a Minecraft night, Noah was able to fill in the entire circle. Props to him for working overtime. As the Minecraft night was coming to an end and the sun rose from the other side of the world, Noah's new project was finally finished. With the platform out of the way, it was time to start making our oxygen. I don't want to have to install water wheels or any type of steam-powered stuff, so we were going to go with wind power. Now one thing I have yet to explain is how you actually make the oxygen itself. We were going to need zinc, copper, and water. I also added a block called an aqueous extruder. To make air, we were going to need water, and this machine made just that. With the zinc, copper, and water all combined together under a heated blaze burner, we could make oxygen. And not only oxygen, but also hydrogen. On each side of the basin were two tanks, one for both of the gases. With our oxygen machine up and running, we were going to produce enough air for all of our lunar expeditions. Although we were going to add a lot more to this area, so we were probably going to have to upgrade our wind power. The last thing I added was a spout. This was so that we could fill our buckets with oxygen and make oxygen tanks. Next to it, I placed a gas charge pad. I put the tanks inside the pad, and it began to fill with air. When it was filled to capacity, I stood on the pad and it filled my spacesuit with oxygen. There were a couple more steps we had to complete before we could finally start building our rocket. Our next goal was to produce rocket fuel. Now trust me when I say that the next thing we're about to do was absolutely crucial. Blaze rods? Ender pearls? What could this possibly mean? If you guess that we're going to the end, then you are 100% correct. The end is a pretty dangerous place. So, finally, for all of you who were saying, make some armor, make some armor, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I also needed a weapon because we were going there with a purpose. There was a crafting item we needed, and the only way we could get it was if we killed the Ender Dragon. I wasn't gonna take the time to design some god-slaying weapon, so I decided to just use whatever leftover manualing we had and forge myself a sword. With the weapon complete, we took our eyes of Ender and did the classic Minecraft journey, a true rite of passage, searching for the stronghold. Of course, thanks to my rending gale, this search was gonna be a breeze. While Noah was walking like a caveman, I was soaring through the sky like an eagle. Along the way, I came across some ruins, wreckage from previous innovators from days gone by. It didn't take long before my final toss went into the ground. This could only indicate one thing, the stronghold was directly beneath my feet. With my excavator, I began to break the one cardinal rule of Minecraft, never dig straight down. And let me tell you, this was a lesson I've had to relearn time and time again. After making myself a secure staircase, I finally broke through the walls and came across the ruins of the stronghold, and this was by far one of the messiest strongholds I've ever seen. Everything was scattered, the paths were broken, thankfully the portal room wasn't that far away. Now because we were far away from our factory, I could actually turn shaders on again. I placed a bed down, set my spawn, and mentally prepared for the journey that awaited us on the other side of the portal. With one small leap, we found ourselves standing on a small obsidian platform. Thankfully we learned our lesson from the Better Minecraft video, and this time we brought pumpkins. With the help of my rending gale, I was able to zip over the void and onto the island. Now it was just a matter of taking out the crystals and killing the dragon. I let the crystals portion to Noah because he had a grappling hook and he had mastered the skill of traveling from building to building. Because he didn't have a rending gale, Noah had to bridge across. But once he finally got there, he jumped into action. Swinging from tower to tower, Noah destroyed each crystal. We stayed on the dragon, following him around, hoping that eventually he would land in the center. It was only a matter of time before he did just that, but not before unleashing a poison spray attack on us. With the dragon hovering over the portal, Noah and I began a relentless wave of attacks. In that moment, we were able to deal a huge chunk of damage. After multiple attacks, the dragon was finished. With that obstacle out of the way, it was time to move forward and find our new ingredient, which could be found in the Outer Islands. Before we continued, we took a moment to appreciate the dragon egg and the beauty of the shaders. 
After that, we set ourselves a little base and began to provoke Endermen. Traveling in the Outer Islands was very difficult without Ender Pearls, so we needed to stock up. It didn't take long before we had a mob of Endermen right at our doorstep. They were just walking right into our swords! By the end of this little mob grinding battle, we had more than enough Ender Pearls to begin our exploration. We scrambled to the floating portal. Now, I don't know why they designed it this way. I always thought it was way too much of a hassle to actually get up there, but I guess challenge was the thing in mind. Now, I took out my Ender Pearl and threw it in, and for some reason I just have this fear that every time I throw the pearl in, I'm probably gonna fall into the void somehow. Now that we were in the Outer Islands, it was only a matter of time before we found that one necessary crafting ingredient. That being a poise bush. Now don't worry, I will explain why we need the poise bush later. We ventured out into the island and thankfully we didn't have to do a lot of island hopping before we came across the one biome where the poise bushes were growing. Unfortunately, I forgot my shears. Thankfully Noah came well prepared, so he gathered as many as he could and then we were on our way back. But not before exploring a little more. Noah came across this weird spider-like creature that, when hit, bounced like a frog. As we were about to cross the portal, he was then assaulted by a pair of Endermen. Now, the reason we got poise bushes was because we were going to be making a new ingot, and that ingot, well, it required the bushes. It also required melted silver, which we could make plenty of with our silver coins. And the final ingredient, Ender Powder. When combined together, you get a metal called Endurium Alloy. The only problem was that we had the wrong type of poise bush. Well, it was the right one, but it wasn't fully grown. We needed to make a phytogenic insulator, something that would make the plants grow way faster. To make that, we were gonna need lumium ingots. They're basically glowstone ingots. You have to melt down the glowstone and combine it with copper and silver. With our magma crucible, we were able to melt down some glowstone that Noah got from the nether. We took all the metals, mixed them up in the smeltery, and we were able to make our lumium. And like I said before, the phytogenic isolator basically speeds up the process, makes the plants grow faster. But we do have to keep a steady supply of water flowing in. By the end of this process, we had fully matured poise bushes. Now we can make our endurium. Now finally, everything that we've done led up to this moment because we were making an ender tank. And what is an ender tank? It's basically like an ender chest, but for liquids. I crafted myself some ender casings with obsidian and an ender pearl. We combined the endurium with inductive mechanisms. This made an endurium mechanism. Or an ender mechanism. One of the two. When you surround the ender casing with the mechanisms, you get an endurium machine. The foundation for all of the endurium blocks. With the help of a smithing table, we were able to combine the endurium machine with the fluid tank, and this gave us an ender tank. And believe it or not, this trouble that we went through, it was absolutely worth it for what was coming next. Now like an ender chest, to get the most out of this block, you're obviously gonna need two of them, because the point of it is to access the same inventory from a completely different area. Now let's say we pump fluids into one of the ender tanks. If we're on the other side of the world and we want to access that same reserve of fluids, then all we have to do is open the ender tank on our end. And in this instance, we were going to be pumping oil. Now the nearest oil reserve is basically an ocean away, hence the reason we needed the ender tank. We weren't going to be going back and forth making multiple trips to scoop the oil one bucket at a time. So the best use of the ender tank was to take the oil, pump it in there, and then access it from the factory. I lowered a hose down into the bottom of the oil reserve. And with the help of wind power, we were able to keep this thing pumping 24-7. We had a steady flow of oil flowing into the ender tank. Now, the only question remained, was it going to show up on the other side? And wouldn't you know it, technology prevails again. Now it was time to refine the crude oil, because we needed rocket fuel. And oil at its basic form was not going to cut it. When you refine crude oil, you get one of two things. One of the products you may get from refining is called heavy oil. It's this red one here. As for the oil with an orange tint, this one is called light oil. As for the refining itself, to get the job done, we were gonna need a block called a fractioning still. The materials that we had, we were able to easily put one together. All I had to do now was set up a system where we could pump the oil from the ender tank into the fractioning still, and then into some storage tanks. I ended up using a lot of pipes and a lot of fluid tank blocks. I installed some pumps and even applied some filters so that we could separate the heavy oil from the light oil. And last but not least, the ender tank. 
we were going to be pumping oil from our ender tank straight into our refining system. I also had to expand the windmill a little because it wasn't turning anymore with all these new additions. With all the pumps up and running, it was time to see if the system actually worked. Oil was going into the fractioning still, and it looked like the machine was actually refining it. And as you can see, just from crude oil, we would get heavy fuel and light fuel. Both variations of the fuel were then pumped into different directions. On the right we had our light fuel, and on the left side we had our heavy fuel. Every once in a while, the pumps would send bursts of either fuel into their respective tanks. There they would be stored until their second refining process. Once they were powered up, we then had the oils pumped into the next fractioning still, where they would be refined into the final product, rocket fuel. The rocket fuel was then transported to a final storage tank where it sat there until we needed to use it for our rocket ships. Our oxygen system and our rocket fuel system all in one section, ready to be used for our new ships. At long last, it was time to make the rocket itself. One of the first blocks we were going to need were the thrusters. This was going to give us lift when we were launching. To make this block, we had to make some blaze burners. Then, I went to the nether and began my journey to our new blaze farm. I had never collected blazes with blaze burners before. I usually left that to Noah, so this was going to be a first for me. I stopped and thought about the best way to approach this without getting burnt to a crisp. In the end, I did just decide to go for it, and yeah, I did burn. Blaze burners in hand, I then combined them with plastic to make our thrusters. It was pretty much the same process to make the rocket's fuel tanks. And to make the actual seat of the rocket, we just had to make a seat itself and then combine it with plastic. We had all the pieces to build our rockets. Now, it was just a matter of figuring out how we were actually going to fuel the thing. Thankfully, the mod pack did include a way to do that. And the best part was that we didn't even have to use any pipes. I gathered some materials to craft some of the last remaining items that was keeping us from going to space. One of the items we needed was called a rocket linking device. Next, I ran over to the mechanical crafter to make our next necessary item. This next block was called a rocket fueling station. Now that we had the linking device and the rocket fueling station, there was only one last thing left for us to do. And that was to craft the final block that would make our rocket ship endeavor possible. I went back to the calculator wing and gathered all the computation matrices we had created. Now in order to make this crafting recipe work, we were going to need to upgrade our mechanical crafter. So, we made the biggest crafting grid we had ever used. And I'm not kidding when I say that this next crafting recipe is massive. It required tons of plastic ingots, most of them on the corners. And then in the center, we needed to apply our eight computation matrices. It was then a matter of just watching all of the pieces come together. At the end of the line, they form one of the most expensive blocks in this mod pack. This was the Rocket Guidance Computer. We had all the pieces we needed to build our rocket. It was finally time to begin assembling it. First things first, without a proper launch pad, this rocket wasn't going anywhere. I then began to lay out the thrusters and started building the rocket up piece by piece. Beside the rocket, I also had to build the launch tower. Thankfully, the tower itself didn't have to be that tall. With the launch pad complete and the rocket fully assembled, all that was left to do was to scan the ship. Finally, everything that we've worked on for the past 400 days was finally coming together. It was time to look at the rocket specs. Before we could launch, everything had to be in order, especially the fuel. After scanning the rocket, we could actually see how much power it had, how much it weighed, and how fast it could accelerate. I began to fill up some buckets so that we could begin the fueling process. Once I loaded the fuel into the fueling station, it was then a matter of getting enough oxygen tanks to make sure that we wouldn't suffocate up there. I also filled some extra buckets of fuel to take with me, because I was warned by the subscribers that I only had enough fuel for one trip. I had no intention of getting stuck on the moon, so we were going to do this right. I almost forgot to craft Planet ID chips. Basically, there are these little microchips that you put into the rocket, and then they tell the ship where to go. And this was just a fun little thing I wanted to do after. If we were going to go on the moon, then of course we had to plant a flag. Everything was set. My shulker box had plenty of extra fuel, including all the materials we needed to build an extra launch pad, just in case something went wrong. We were set to launch in the morning. Unfortunately, the rocket could only seat one, so Noah was stuck building his rocket last minute. It was finally launch day, and thanks to our fueling station and our rocket linking device, we were able to wirelessly fuel our rocket ship. It was time for the final countdown. Everything that we've done, this is what it was for. In a few seconds, we were going to be launching to the moon! And just like that, we had liftoff.
Sitting inside of the rocket ship, there were three things you could actually see. The first being how much fuel you had, the second being how much velocity, and the last one showing your elevation. Within a matter of seconds, we were hundreds of blocks off the ground. It didn't take long before we began descending on what looked like the surface of the moon. Although the sky did look a little weird. This was a very shaky landing, but thankfully the rocket didn't explode. After a quick descent, we made a safe touchdown. Honestly, I expected the sky to be a little darker. Maybe it was our shaders, but eh, we were on the moon, so who's complaining? As for the moon itself, well, there wasn't a lot going on here. It was in this moment that I realized I made a terrible mistake. I forgot to bring my shulker box. This was a bittersweet moment because yes, we were on the moon, yes, I planted my flag, but unless Noah got here, I was gonna die. What's even worse was that Noah was having problems with his rocket. It wouldn't launch, it was glitched for some reason. It was day 400 and I was stuck on the moon. Was this gonna be the end of our industrial ambitions? Did I actually fly too close to the sun? I didn't know how long it was gonna take for Noah to get me, so until then, I was just gonna have to make myself comfortable. It may take one day, it may take 10 days, heck, it may even take another 100 days, but I had no intent on dying here, so if you want another video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed. This is Double Sal, I'll see you next time.